Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And on this week's roundtable, we have the usual suspects, mine's a few. So let's just go around, but we have a special guest, which I'm really excited about. We have, of course, the technician, Eric Peterson, landopia.com. Eric, how are you? I'm good. Happy to be here. Eric, I'm very excited. We got some uh, some new things coming out from you. Uh, we do. Pretty soon. You want to just give a, a sneak peek? Um, Were you I not ready? Is it not ready to that, talk about? But uh, I can. Give That's okay. Good. Look, I don't. I don't want to put you on the spot. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> Too late. All right, well, well, let's we'll let's leave, leave Zeno in suspense. Around. We we get the Zen master. Breathe in the mailing. Breathe out the marketing. Mike Zeno, how are you? Doing great, Mark. Great to be here. It's great to see you. It's good to see you. I love it when you call me Big Papa. Tate Litchfield. What's up, Tate? Not much. Just a cold and windy day in Las Vegas, unfortunately. It is cold here, too. It was like 30s this morning. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I couldn't even go, like, get the mail yesterday. It was so windy and cold. Just not yeah, I, going I will, out there. I will say my cold shower this morning. Fast and cold. <laughs> no way. Impossible. It was cold. It was thir- Mike, it was 30s. What is, what is it there? <laughs> it's, yes. I, I'm not, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll compare suffering later. And then, of course, last but not least, we got Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmoto.com. If you're automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek learn anything about anything at investor ninjas.com scott todd how are you mark i'm great how are you i'm great but i have a question scott okay you know do you take any sort of pride in when your flight school grads go out into the world and fly away like do you even know what they do afterwards well, not, not all the time. Like, I don't always know, but uh, it, it always makes me uh, happy when I see people who went through flight school and then they pop up somewhere, whether it's boot camp or they pop up, uh, I don't know, like on a podcast like this. And I didn't know they were going to be here. And I'm like, wow, he's still here. It's always fun. Yeah. So I got a Vox from uh, Mike Zeno. He's like, Mock. We got to have Joey Chiarello on the podcast. The guy's <laughs> crushing it. And he, it's, it's after flight school. Because usually it's like after coaching that they really get to that next level of, you know, over 10000 a month in passive. But flight school grads do it too. It just takes a little longer. So Gio, Joey Chiarello, welcome to the round table. And I think it'd be fun to do like a little question answer segment from each one of us. So my first question to you, Joey, is how the heck did you get started in land investing? How did you find LandGeek? Hey, Mark. I heard you and actually Scott Todd was on the podcast too. You guys were on the Sales Whisperer uh, back in 2017, I think. And you guys were discussing, you know, just your business in general. And I, I found it super appealing. So I started to do a little bit of research. And from there, I probably spent a month or two researching before I jumped on a call with Zeno. And then what did, what did Mike have to say to you? I approached him about flight school mostly because I wasn't really interested in the toolkit, having to weed through all the videos and books. I figured if I was gonna make the commitment I liked the interactive live option, having Scott at your fingertips basically to answer all your questions. So he told me, you know, ideally, if you set this up correctly, you could spend roughly two hours a day on the business. Um, Looking back, I mean, obviously I've spent a lot more than that, but I can see where some of you guys might have all your stuff automated and that's what it comes down to. But I just kind of, I just kind of dove in with flight school after talking to to Zeno and that was my first step really. Wow. Wow. Let's, uh, let's hand the mic over to Eric. Eric, what's your question for Joey? So I think my first question is, um, at this point in the process, 
Um, for you, Joey, what would you say your biggest challenges are in your business? Uh, definitely staying organized. I think now that we have, you know, the amount of notes that we do coming in, <clears throat> in the beginning, I was just kind of happy to get notes however I could. So I offered all different forms of payment, you know, PayPal, Square, like, you know, probably six different options. And now it's kind of getting a little bit chaotic when I'm trying to track payments and they're coming in on different, you know, streams. So that I would wish, probably... I, I wish somebody built a software to solve that problem. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke to you about that at boot camp, Mark. Oh yeah. What was that? Geekpay.io? Yeah, I remember. Yeah, no worries, Joey. I'm not I'm, you that. know. I'm yeah. glad that you're on the round table though, sharing your your challenges that I've already solved, but no, it's okay. Do you have any other challenges that don't have the easiest of solutions? Um, that's my immediate probably issue. Other than that, just deciding whether or not I want to commit to a CRM. Some of the, the process stuff, you know, I don't, I'm kind of old school, but I'm realizing it'd be nice to find some programs that would help facilitate, you know, the processes, I guess. Okay, great. Um, Mike Zeno, what, what questions do you have for Joey? Well, I, Joey and I, we, we communicate here and there after uh, flight school. And Joey, I know there was a time uh, we had talked and uh, you were advertising and it wasn't really going the way you'd hoped. What, what was the big turning point for you? When did it feel like all of a sudden, like, okay, like I'm kidding my stride? You know, what, what, what was, what, what, when was that? You know, and, and how did it feel? And because, you know, I think if I remember correctly, we talk about, you know, the mailing and the marketing is very similar, right? Lots of, uh, lots of ads, lots of mails, mailers go out, lots of contacts, but it's a process you have to kind of embrace and, and then kind of uh, deal with. So, but anyway, when, when was that, when was that, when was that turning point for you where you really felt like, okay, um, you know, um, cause you know, we all get to embrace that suck initially. Right. But then even after flight school, because what I, tell people quite honestly with the flight school, it, it works if you work it, but the, the, the real test is going to be once it's over and Scott's not there, um, you know, telling you what to do and keeping you motivated and keeping you on track. And then you're left to your own accord. And that's where people, um, uh, you know, they, they shine or they don't. So what was that turning point for you? You know, how did it, uh, you know, when did you feel that? Um, I don't the only thing I could think of maybe that I would consider a turning point was we had a couple good months uh, in 2018 where I think we sold like 11 or 12 properties in one month. Right. And that helped get our passive up to somewhat of a respectable level. Um, but it's realized like it's just been consistent. You know, like we have slow months, we have good months, but just keep marketing, keep looking for good properties. Eventually they sell. Sometimes you don't have control over that. But we just stay consistent, really. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Awesome. And Joey, what what are you at right now as far as your passive? Uh, we just hit thirteen k. Thirteen k. And and how long did it take you to achieve that after flight school? Uh, two years. Two years. Okay. Great. Great. And are you doing this full-time, part-time? I still have a full-time gig. I do uh, solar sales here in Phoenix, Scottsdale, you know, we're your neck of the woods. But uh, yeah, the, the land is starting to take up a lot more of my time just because it's been so fruitful. So I still juggle full-time job, but I would say I'm doing this quite a bit too. Great, great. Tate, what questions do you have for Joey? All right, I'm going to ask the question all of our listeners want to know. Joey, where are you mailing? How much are you offering? And no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll make the property. Yeah, yeah. Can you tell me exactly where you're mailing, how much you pay, what it is going to sell for, where you sell it, who buys it, and, <laughs> and, and the email address of all your buyers list. That's all we Yeah, do. exactly. That's that's really no that Joey, I'm the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Joey, uh, I'm happy to see you on here today, man. It's been a while since I've chatted with you. 13K, I mean, my hat goes off to you, man. That's that's life-changing money right there. So congratulations on that. My, my 
my question has to do with, it does have to do with acquisitions. What would you say your average acquisition cost is for a property? You know, I, I look at acquisition costs, but I buy properties so many different ways. I mean, I bought from Eric, I bought from Scott, I bought from other, you know, investors wholesale. So um, on a traditional mailing list, I, you know, I would say I, I follow the, the two to three percent response rate, but then <clears throat> acquisition costs are still, <clears throat> I think, hard for me to calculate because sometimes I'll buy a property that has a lot of back taxes, you know, if I can still make margin on it. So um, I think there's too many variables to give like a precise answer on that. I'd love to have one, but I buy from so many different avenues that each one is so different, you know, yeah, as well. I know. Cost me. I, I'm, I'm the same way, right? There's no way, bad way to necessarily get a property. And if there's money to be made, I'll buy it at any price point. So um, I guess my next question Let's talk a little bit about notes because that's what's built your $13,000 a month passive income. What would you say your average monthly note price is? 100 bucks, 200 bucks, 300 bucks? I actually try to stay to a minimum of 200 just because I've noticed a lot of the clientele that haggle you for a $100 or $150 payment, they end up defaulting a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. um, I do have probably five or six clients at 150 uh, but everything else is 200 and up. I think that's, I, I think there's somebody out there who said that was the sweet spot. Maybe, maybe Scott Todd, isn't that what you tell in flight school that you love that $200 a month note, Scott? I do. Yeah. You know, I think you gotta do what the market will bear, but I like that sweet spot. Yeah. yeah you know, I'm, it'd be great. I'm Julie. the same way. Like, like I would say, Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Tate. I was going to say, like, I, I would say our sweet spot, like, I love that one, 150, 200, 250 mark. That is, it's an easy way to build that passive really, really quickly. So, Yeah, 200 seems to be the sweet spot. Yeah, Joey, it'd be great if somebody built a software that just automated notifications and you didn't even have to worry about defaults. You just, they would just know and you could just resell that property, get another down payment. Just kind of automated it, made it really easy, ACH, so you're paying a lot less and Man, I wish that was out. Oh, wait. It is geekpay.io. Never, never mind, though, because I know Scott Todd's got a, a burning question for you. Scott? I would just say that one of the things that a lot of people struggle with is they struggle sometimes with, like, counties, right? Like, choosing the county. I'm not asking you to, to like, take it to tell me your county. But I would, I would say, like, Joey, like, when, when you started in flight school, and you started like you went to a county. Are you still in that county or did you have to hunt and peck a little bit? And then the follow up to that is if no matter what, what do you think makes a good county? Uh, by the way, funny, I did listen to that podcast where you guys said, is it rude if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, what county are you working? <laughs> yeah. See, I'm not asking you what county you're working. I taped it. Just yeah. Say, well, see, see, therein, therein, lies, therein lies further proof, by the way that oh you, here we go see, here go we go reclining seats and being you know considerate i'm not gonna do that to you see tate just went right into your space but me i'm giving i'm i'm like setting the question up correctly so good here we uh, go well i had my county picked out before i started flight school because the i had done a little bit of homework and you know the, the homework was to get a list so i had grabbed a list from the county that was um, where I was already thinking about working. So that made it easy. And then I still heavily worked that county and I branched out to two other counties um, somewhat adjacent. So I'm really working too hard. And the third one is just if I come across stuff, but I don't mail to it. Okay. Nice, nice. So Joey, what was it like being in flight school for you? Uh, it's funny. I went to two, the first one, or sorry, I was the two boot camps, but flight school itself, um, it was good. Again, like I wish I would have had a little bit more time in the business so I could have utilized Scott more, but at the same token, you know, he did lay out pretty much a step-by-step -step on what you need to do. So, you know, that's why I invested the money in that versus the toolkit was, you know, you had an hour to an hour and a half with him to go over everything. He lays out what you need to do and then do it again with questions the next week. So 
there was really nothing, you, no hurdles you couldn't get through when you had him there to help you out. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, Zen Master, what question do you have for Joey? I already asked my question. Do I get another one? You get another one. We're just going to keep going around until Joey's Ooh. like raises uh, the white flag. It's like enough of the grilling. Uh, do you work alone in the business, Joey? I, I know, uh, you know, is it just you or? Uh, my wife's helping out. She's been doing mostly most of the stuff on the website and marketing. And then uh, just recently, actually in the last month or so, have her doing some recording of the deeds on online. Uh, so she gets a couple hours in every day and it's definitely helpful. Okay. And what advice would you have to people out there? Um, there are people out there uh, listening that uh, would like to work as a team, uh, husband and wife, any advice? I mean, <clears throat> I always joke that we don't work well together, but I think it's because we're both doers. So when I try to teach her stuff, I get frustrated, you know, because I know how to do it already. So mm -hmm. the advice I would say is patience and, you know, just know who you're working with, what works well with them. I mean, we're still learning that as we go. Um, but, you know, we're both strong-minded people. So again, we kind of want to just grab the computer and do it ourselves. So it makes it challenging, but I think each couple, it'll just depend on how they, how they work well together or not and what they need to do to learn from that. Awesome. Awesome. Eric Peterson, what do you, yeah, what do you got, got for Joey? I've got two more. Um, number one is uh, you talked about having a full-time job still and, and doing that alongside with your land business. So how long are you spending or how many hours per day are you spending on your land business currently? And then after that, what's been your best deal to date? Uh, Honestly, the hours a day, it depends on if leads are coming in. I'd say the majority of my time is talking to buyers, you know, or getting them pictures or sending them information. You know, I still handle the sale unless my wife's handling it through like her Facebook or something at the, you know, big picture, I'm handling the closing of it, you know, getting them to commit. So if it's a fruitful month, a couple hours a day on just dealing with leads, if they're coming in and then you know, then all just the, the typical stuff, running to the bank, getting stuff notarized, you know. So I don't know, I'd definitely say a few, three to four hours a day. Then I juggle my other job in and out. That's a sales job too. So luckily I can do both kind of at the same time. And then on the biggest profit, um, you want cash or terms? <laughs> Whichever one stands out to you as, as your best deal. Yes, we want yes. <laughs> so, oh, of course you do, Tate. Of course you do. <laughs> we had two that are recent last two weeks. So um, the term sale was a property I paid $1,500 for, and I sold it for $17,000 on terms. Uh, it does need a road, which I got some estimates coming in today, but looks like it's only going to cost me around maybe 1500 bucks. So I'll be all in for call it 3,500 and sold it for 17 on terms. Cash sale. Uh, we had one the other day. It was kind of a big one. It was a 10 K we paid for it and we've sold it for 23. So not the typical double, but since it was a bigger dollar amount, we were happy with that. I mean, it's, it's still a really good margin and it's still a really good return for yeah, sure. Um, I wouldn't personally, I'd rather do terms, but I'm just joking. I'm happy I, I, would, I, I would do that deal. I'm happy with my passive. I need some cash to buy some more land. So I'll take it. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Tate, what questions do you have? All right. Um, for somebody who's just getting into the land business, what would you say is a personal attribute that, that they should have or learn to develop to be successful? Uh, kind of funny you ask. I keep having, you know, family and friends ask me if they should get in the business and, you know, is it something I should do? And so I've met with my, one of my relatives quite a few times and I just keep asking them like, is this something that you want to stay consistent at and put the time in? <clears throat> because that's really what it takes is consistency and time, I think. So, the attribute would just be committing to something that 
it's going to take some time to get going and you're going to have to hustle in the beginning, but if you stay at it, you know, it can be fruitful. I love it. Yeah. I would agree with you that and grit, right? It just, sometimes you just got to embrace the suck and just do it. Cause there's a lot of days where it's not exactly fun, you know? Yeah. They go together. I mean, you guys talk about grit all the time. It, the same thing is consistency really in my eyes is you got to do it no matter what. Absolutely. Scott Todd, any questions for Joey? All right, Joey. So uh, you have a you have a very nice passive income coming in. Now I know that passive income doesn't tell the whole story because you get cash sales along the way. You get I mean you got a nice little cash nugget here. Why are you still working? <laughs> well, you know Mark came up with Land Geek, but there's no uh, W two employment with benefits and insurance and paid time off in the land business. So. Uh, I'm still keeping my W-2 job right now. We got a baby on the way and another little one at home. So it helps to have uh, some of the consistency of a W-2. You know, oh, okay. Okay. Follow up question. So does your wife work or is she stay at home with the kids? She does not other than, you know, that when baby goes to school, she's working on the land business for a few hours in the morning. There you go, man. Look, that, there's, there's what I was actually looking for, something like that. Because ultimately, Mark, you know, it's not necessarily about Joey leaving. It's about this has produced a cash flow that will allow them to live a lifestyle that they want to live. And his wife gets to stay home with the children, work on the land business along the way. Like, you know, jo Joey's really living the dream and continuing to build a solid foundation because one day he is going to quit his job. And uh, he just probably needs some higher number or something. But you know what? They're, they're doing well, right? And that's that's a, that's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, if we, if we keep going out and he keeps staying consistent, that 13 a month becomes 20 a month. And eventually it's going to get to a point, where maybe it's 40, 50 a month. And, and then he's got options. So, I mean, he's got options now, technically speaking. I mean, you know, some people have more expensive tastes than others, like Zeno. So, which would mean that's probably why he's still at the fire station. I mean, for me, I don't need to have the most expensive tequila on the market, but Zeno does. And therefore that consistent income, I think allows him to sleep well at night, knowing that he can fund the, you know, extravagant lifestyle. Well, for me, it's just extravagant to not have to be anywhere on, on, on a Monday. At right, beach. You're at the beach. At the beach. You're at the beach. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, Joey, I think we, we talked about this a little bit last week. What was that ideal number we all thought you would need to start with as starting capital? Do you have any thoughts on that? Like how much money did you actually start with? And looking back on it now, do you have a number that you think if you were going to advise someone that it would be ideal to start with this much capital? No, I don't think there's a magic number. I mean, obviously if you're weighing the investment cost of flight school, that's, you know, it's not a thousand bucks. So that's been the conversation with my cousin who keeps asking me about it is, you know, she doesn't really want to invest the six to seven grand or whatever flight school is going for at the time. But I said, why don't you start with the toolkit? Um, it's still going to give you, you know, your basic understanding and what you need to do. And her question was kind of similar to yours is they think they need to have all this money to buy a property. And I said, it's not true. Start with one lot. You know, you can buy one parcel for 600 bucks, just get your feet wet, see how it goes. And then when you sell that property and double or triple your money, you're going to find the other money to buy more property once you've proven the success. So I don't really think there's a number that anybody needs to start with. Obviously it'd be nice to have five or 600 bucks to buy a lot with and maybe obviously pay for one of your courses to have the legwork going, but I don't think there's an amount that's a necessity in the beginning now. Okay. Eric Peterson. Yes. Any you more questions for, for my number? No, no, we talked about this. No, do, no. What what other questions do you have for Joey? I mean, I can grill oh. Joey all day, but I just want to know. I can come up with more questions. questions. Sure. Um, so VAs, 
how many VAs are you currently working with in your business? And uh, what kind of functions are they doing for you? Right now, I only have one VA, and I actually just uh, found him after realizing my VA that I'd had for like a year was just not capturing the amount of data that that I needed and for the amount I was paying him. So um, he's doing all my basically list scraping or setting up my Excel so I can send out my offers. Um, that's really the only thing I outsource other than, you know, uploading the mailer and sending it out and stuff like that. He, that's all he does. I handle everything else personally. So, you know, I know there's room for improvement on VAs or automation or handing stuff off, but you know, I like the sale and I don't want anybody else to fumble the sale. So I'm perfectly fine handling that portion. And the rest is really just paperwork, which that I'm starting to hand off to the wife. So that seems to be a decent, a decent mix. Is there anything kind of on your list as, as the next pain point that you do want to outsource, whether that's handing it off to your wife or, or sending it off to a VA? Um, I mean, j literally just in the last couple of days, it's been great to have her pick some deeds, upload some deeds and get them recorded. Um, it gives me the freedom to run to a solar appointment or run and do some stuff and know that she's still able to get some of that stuff done. When I sold a property, she can get it recorded. Um, that's a huge help. Excellent. Nice. Nice. Zen Master, what questions do you have? Do you, uh, do you, we talked a little bit about your, uh, I think you dove a little bit into your, you know, daily schedule and whatnot on, you know, how many hours you're adding and all that, but uh, do you do all the land business from home? Do you have an office there? Do you go out to the, uh, to the uh, Starbucks? Uh, where do you do all your business? I do a good chunk of it from home, but if I get too distracted here, then I will work at, you know, a coffee shop or something. For a long time, I was working at my office, uh, my solar office, but they, uh, they, they gave me the ax on working on about two weeks ago. So they said, you're doing way too much of this land stuff, not enough solar when you're here. <laughs> so <laughs> I uh, was a little upset because it's nice to be able to do both and utilize a, an office with a printer and all the good stuff. But I understand where they're coming from. So shifted gears and respected their wishes on that. Note. Nice. Did you ever visit nice. any of your properties, Joey? What's that? Have you ever visit any of your properties? We just curious. Yeah, I in the beginning I went and looked at um, two ten acres that I bought because it was a big investment for me and it was like my second property that I'd ever bought in the land business, so I was pretty nervous. Um, so I did go look at that. It was nice to be able to see it, take some photos, be able to speak to it. So you know, I do think there's some bonuses there, but I know obviously. You know, the other 95%, I, I don't go to them. I just have a local person take photos and the usual that all of you guys do. Okay, excellent. Big Papa. What aspect of the business don't you enjoy doing? Or what, if there's one thing that you, that you hate about the land business, what would it be? Uh, I mean, just on a kind of a nuisance level, it's, you know, when the recordings get rejected or some of the like fine comb paperwork, I'm not like a super attention to detail kind of guy. So if I get, you know, in a hurry and I screw up the legal description and they reject it, it's, just, it's more annoying than anything to have to go fix that stuff. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. That is a terrible feeling. I hate the paperwork side of the business, like deeds, recording, notarizing deeds. It's, that's the worst. Yeah. I do have a goofy one too that uh, completely separate topic. Well, same topic, but different issue. I have a, two clients threatening to sue me based on somebody driving over their, the neighbor's land. And so kind of like your squatter issue, a bunch of, a bunch of stuff related around that. So that hasn't been fun, but ultimately they don't have a leg to stand on. So I'm not, I'm not sweating or losing sleep over it. Interesting. I've never even heard of that. Wow. Yeah, they have I mean, the, the person on the southern parcel is stating that it's my fault that my tenant drove on their land. And I said, how can I control what somebody is doing on your property? I don't have any control over them. That's ridiculous. So, you know, they're 
well, they ruined my land. I'm going to sue you for 50000 I said, go ahead. You're not going to win anything. You're just wasting your time. Oh, that's a, that's a first. But if I were neighbors with Eric Peterson, I might think about that strategy. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Got, we might, might be neighbors, free, Mark. I know. It might give me some free barbecue at the very least. He'd be like, look, I'll settle. Rack of ribs. Like, done. Um, Scott Todd, any questions for Joey? All right, Joey. If you could go back to flight school, what would you do differently uh, than what you did? Like, what would you change if you go back to, well, back when you were in flight school? I think that's my biggest thing I keep uh, talking about during flight school is not having been in the business long enough to have you as a resource. So what I would do is accelerate everything, essentially, you know, be as deep into it as I could or do as much of the prelim work going into flight school as I could so that when I was in week two or three or four, maybe I was getting some accepted offers back. Maybe I was going deeper into the sale. Um, so yeah, really, I mean, having the list was nice, having a county picked was nice, but you know, if I would have had a sale, let's say, or an accepted offer come in and had you there for that, it would have just made me less, you know, reluctant to go through with everything. Cause I would have been able to know exactly what I needed to do. And, you know, that, that's one of the things Mark is like, um, you know, we, we're always looking at the flight school flow, right. You know, and so we're always looking at the flow of things. I know that since Joey went through his flight school, we have changed things up. So like we, we have a, a gap week in there. Uh, we talk about how to buy land wholesale so that you can go out there and we force people. That sounds kind of harsh, right? But we, we push people to take action, to, to buy a piece of land before they come to the marketing piece so that they're there, they go through the sales piece. So we, we've changed some things up since Joey was there. And I'm glad that uh, Joey's feedback is there because it kind of, uh, confirms what we've done might be in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think, yeah, Mike, I don't think it's exaggeration to say that most people, um, pay for their flight school tuition after eight to 12 weeks. Is that correct? Cause it only takes one deal. Right. Well, I think it's strategically priced at that point that it can be recouped in one deal. And that's the, that's the beauty of it. Not many uh, models out there. You can recap your investment with one deal. And Scott, it's not harsh when, when you do that. I think it's, we could probably say it's Mac as opposed to surface. It's Mac. That's the other word for harsh. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll roll with that. It's I'll Mac. That. Yeah. Okay. I'm good. Joey, are you a Mac or PC guy? Uh, PC. And just on that, uh, on that last note, can't remember if it was my first sale. It was not the first property I bought. I think it was the second property I bought right out of flight school. Um, I sold it for 19000 on terms. So that paid for flight school. And it was probably my second deal done. Yeah, nice. Very nice. Um, wow, we, we've really covered a lot. Joey, wh what, if, what should we be asking you that we haven't asked you yet? Uh, I, I, wait, I've got it. I've got it. I know what people want to know. They want to know your expenses. What are your, what are your monthly expenses in the land business? So that's a good question with tax time right here. We're trying to, you know, get everything, get all our ducks in a row and see what true acquisition costs might be if, if we can boil it down or what are our monthly expenses. But um, really the only expense is the mailing uh, all the marketing we do, you know, Craigslist, Facebook, the typical streams, those don't have any costs. So it's really just mailing, no, you know, notaries are free. I do it at my bank, you know, so a little bit of postage maybe when I'm sending deeds out, but you know, you're talking 25 to $50 a month and that stuff, if that. So my only, you know, expense would be the VA, uh, which is only a couple hundred bucks a month, the mailings and recording fees. How much are you investing on your mailings per month? I'm a little bit unique in that sense that I don't follow the traditional um, mailing 
consistently part. I'm not not consistent, but I buy land in all forms and fashions. So sometimes if my mailings are only getting a two to five percent hit rate like they're supposed to, I'll get creative and find other other ways to buy land, either wholesale or even if it's maybe a market that looks retail and I'll call an offer, you know, a price to them. It might even be on Zillow. Um, so I've just been luckily and creative enough to always find a way to, to keep my inventory up. And I can tell you the majority of it is actually not from mailings. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Eric, what questions do you have? All right. I got another one. So biggest mistake that you've made so far in the land business? Um, I mean, I listen to you guys when you, t when you have this question answered, I always think like, is there one that stands out for me? And again, it's kind of just goofy. I think, you know, I bought a property that was like under an LLC and some other local person had the same exact LLC name. So, you know, the property was deeded to me. I think I had already had it sold on terms. And then, you know, a couple months later, I get a call from some other person saying, Hey, I'm the owner of that LLC. You don't own that property. Um, but really the beauty of this is all that can be untangled. You know, it, it's a little bit stressful the first time you go through it. But then when you realize like, you know, all I got to do is record an affidavit stating it was an erroneous recording or whatever, you know, you learn the process as you go to make the corrections. But um, I've had that happen two or three times where it was just an issue with the recording or an LLC or, or you know, breaking title maybe. But again, you, you know, all that stuff, you can go back and get it fixed for the most part. So you just learn as you go. Excellent. Right. It sounds like you were resourceful enough to, to be able to figure out how to get that done. Yeah, I mean, luckily, you know, you just you call the county if you play nice or figure out whatever the strategic way is to get the answers you need. You can figure out how to, you know, get it back to the right person and figure it out. Awesome. Nice. Nice. Zen Master, how about you? Um, I would say my final question would be, what's, the, you know, what's the biggest impact this has had upon your life? If you look at the whole thing, you know, it's been a couple of years now. Um, what's the overall the sense of accomplishment? Uh, is it the passive income? What's, you know, what's, what is it? Uh, I think the passive income was always attractive to me. Uh, I love cash flips too, so I'm not heavily slated one way or the other, but I definitely like the passive. So, I mean, hitting this, hitting 10 K was definitely big. Uh, where it's made the biggest impact is we had a really slow, last six to eight months in solar. So, you know, I, I tell my wife all the time, if we didn't have the land business, we would, I don't know what we'd be doing, but we wouldn't be able to pay the mortgage with how slow solar has been. So having it there is really, you know, it's alive in a sense when my full-time job was just going through kind of a down cycle. All right, thank you. Awesome. Do you guys hear that background noise or is it just me? I hear it. Oh, okay. I don't know what that is. Um, I'll just blame Tate. <laughs> so Tate, any any final questions? No, I think we've uh, covered it pretty well. Joey, congrats, man. I mean, don't take your foot off the gas. That's my advice to you is uh, you, you got a taste of it. And now it'll be interesting to talk to you in, you know, another 12 months and see what more you've outsourced. And I think, we all kind of, when you said you're not, you don't have very many VAs, my advice would be go out and get some more VAs. They don't cost as much and you can find quality people out there for very, very inexpensive. And yeah, hang on to the sales. You're obviously really, really good at it. Don't get rid of that. But uh, some of the other aspects of the business, if they can free up your wife's time or your time, it's worth the every penny that you'll put into it. That's my advice, but great job, man. I'm happy for you. And uh, best of luck on your future land deals. Thank you. Scott Todd, any final questions? I don't have a final question. I would just say, Joey, you're doing great, man. Keep mailing, keep marketing, and let freedom ring, baby. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Joey, I hope to see you at Phoenix Boot Camp. Well, dates on that one? April something. 
It's at thelandgeek.com forward slash boot camp. Yep. We'll look into it. That's the one I'm hoping to have my cousin attend to. So that'd be awesome. Okay, great. Great. Yeah. How was boot camp for you? You've been to two. The first one was great because I was pretty fresh in the business. So it was, you know, kind of like a fire hose on that one. But the second one where I got to bring my wife and again was probably in the business for a year at the time, picked up some new stuff. It was good to kind of catch up with a lot of you guys that were there and, and just learn stuff that was more relevant at that time in the business. So again, it's just kind of a timing thing where you're at in the business, you pick up different things at, at the boot camp, depending on, you know, what you're going through. Okay, great. Yeah. April 17th to the 19th um, for sure. Well, I, I want to say, you know, we are so proud of your success. Um, and this is why we do what we do because we want to make that impact. And we really want to see people succeed in this way to get to that point where they're out of solo economic dependency, which means if they're not working, they're not making any money, which, you know, once we solve that, that big bucket of stress in our life, we call money. Um, I'd make the argument that once that's solved, you can really go and, and, you know, improve all your relationships. You have oceans of energy to really do the things you really want to do in life. And I hope that's having an effect for you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I want to just remind everybody that today's podcast is sponsored by none other than Flight School. So if you want to be like Joey Chiarello, learn more, get on a call with the Zen Master Mike Zeno or the Nightcap OG, Scott Bossman, go to uh, landgeek.com forward slash training and get a free strategy call and see if Flight School is right for you. Scott Todd will take you up that mountain of land investing over 16 weeks and you too can start generating passive income cash deals and be the next joey chiarello all right uh joey are we good yeah thanks guys appreciate it thank you joey. all right thanks joey tater are we good yep very good zen mas zen master scott we're good i guess eric too eric are we good indeed we are good all right. Just a reminder, the only way that we're going to be able to continue providing the quality of guests like a Joey Chiarello is if you do us three little favors, you got to subscribe, you got to rate, you got to review the podcast, send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the passive income launch kit course, as well as the newest wholetailing course, how to double your money 30 days or less. Joey, you ready for this? Sure. One, two, three. Let, Let freedom, freedom ring. ring. Wait, we didn't do a tip of the week. We didn't do a tip of the week. From you guys. Me too. All right, yeah, Scott, what's your tip of the week? Okay, check this out. We all want to be nomads, right? Like we all just want to be out there living, living the nomad life, like wherever we want to, doing this business from everywhere. You guys agree? But wouldn't yeah, it be absolutely. great if we could find like where we really want to be because like weather and all this other stuff check out this tip and i'll actually share my screen too it's it's at nomadlist.com forward slash climate hyphen finder i'll share my screen with you guys too and mark this is what's cool because check this out you can come in here and you can say hey uh show me like i want the maximum temperature to be whatever so like here for you maximum temperature in the summer what's a good number for you mark like 72 72 80? max no no it's summer oh for me yeah oh 115 no 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 Where, like <laughs> oh, I, oh ideally 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 let's say in the summer 82 82 all right so we come in here and say 82 and then we can search on the cities and it will show us like good cities like you'll see there's 167 cities that match the criteria okay like mexico city Buenos Aires. Okay. But now we can do add filters, right? So we can come in here and add other filters. So we can say, well, do you like humid or no humid? No humidity. No humidity. So like, I don't know, maximum of like, I don't know, 35% maybe. Sure. And we come in here and, oh, see, we're starting to get somewhere now during the summer. Look at this. Wow. 
you, you should be in Chile or Germany. Look at this. Germany. And then what's cool is you can keep adding filters, but let's just say that we want to explore this town in Germany. We can click this little town here. And not only that, but it now shows me um, like the nomad score and the cost of living. And I can come over here and like search down even further, like the cost of living, like uh, cost of living for expats, like $1,600 a month. Uh, for the locals is there, you know, I can see for a family, $4,000 a month, hotels, hotel per night, Airbnbs per night, $53 Airbnb, uh, coffee, beer. I can look at the pros and cons. Not much to do here in this little town. It's okay. Not many nomads go there, but then I could also come over and change my filter to say, I want a minimum number of nomads in the area because I want to co-work with people, etc. I can look at reviews neighborhoods check out the neighborhoods the neighborhoods tell me based on whether they're hipsters or tourists like man there's a lot of hipsters in this area here but it shows you by neighborhood man you could make all of your nomadic dreams come true right here this is phenomenal yeah well i, I tell you what so I'm I, gonna do this it. is this is what i'm going to do once kids are uh yeah. out of the house hit the road jack i'm hitting the road i'm i'm going to live that nomad lifestyle at go. least for a little bit yeah i would do why not all right great you know you know we didn't ask joey though recline or don't recline while traveling yeah joey what, what's your opinion on this for flights yeah yeah on a, on a plane like would you do you recline or do you not recline if i'm gonna sleep i recline if i'm gonna read then i sit up Bingo. Mike? Uh, Eric? I mean, Eric, what, what do you say to Joey? I'm disappointed. <laughs> Did I miss this? I, I feel like I had something floating around. Yeah, yeah. This, this, was, this, was, this, was, this is bonus content, I think, a couple weeks ago, where after boot camp, we were talking to Tate, and we are all saying, like, you know, we're all flying back. Do you recline or you don't you recline? None of us would recline out of common courtesy for our fellow passengers, but Tate is a recliner. It's like three inches. It's not going to affect the person behind you. Exactly. Exactly, Joey. If they, exactly. Have a surface, if they have a surface, you're right. If they have a Mac, it's game over. I think what we realized is it's game over. Well, if you're hitting the computer behind you, then obviously pull your chair up. If you're not, then go to sleep and enjoy it. Right? It's very simple. I agree with you 100%, Joey. It's and very well pragmatic. Put. I like it. Very pragmatic. Well put. It. Look, I golden rule it, Joey. It's a golden rule. So you don't mind when people recline? Pete? Where do you people, put what's that? You? People in front of you. People in front of you recline, and you're like, whoa, they're in my space. Now, what's the rule? The <laughs> there is rule. no rule. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. Uh, I mean, if I had a computer up and somebody reclining to me, yeah, I'd be a little bit annoyed or I'd ask them to move. But if they want to sleep, and what if I'm sleeping and the person in front of me wants to sleep? Everybody's happy. Yeah, there you go. Then it, it, it applies. <laughs> Drop the mic, Mark. That's it. Game over. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> dropping the mic there because – Joey just dropped the mic. I, I'm not dropping the mic because – We're going to delete Joey it. Just said, right. We're going to delete it. <laughs> we're, we're deleting it? The ending. Oh, didn't get recorded. Is this, is this podcast like beat over that now? section? Are we editing? Yeah. <laughs> We're editing. <laughs> because no, of the recline? We're going to have Julie just say, sensitive. don't recline. <laughs> can't live it in. I mean, I, I think he's got a good argument, though. If okay. the person, had, if the, it's, it's not a bad argument, it's a great argument. Well, it, it would be the same argument as me asking Joey, uh, what county are you in? How much are you paying for property? And, uh, you know, who are you? No. Selling? Same no. argument, man. Like, same it's thing. Not. It's inconsiderate. It's okay. It's all right, though. It's all right. Yeah. So Someone put on Facebook, they, they listened to it, and they, they showed me what they, they do with their shoes in the house. Joey, when people come into your home, do you make them take their shoes off? I don't. Yeah, I take them off when I go into client's house, but you know we got a dog and pets and kids running around, so there's no point in taking your shoes off in my house. 
Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Well, again, thanks again. And um, I know Mike's got to run here very soon. Yeah, so we don't want this goal. bonus content to go on too long. And Pretend. certainly we don't want to re revisit the reclining argument again. All right, Mark. See you later. All right. See you guys. <laughs> See you guys. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>